All right, uh, hello everybody, and welcome to the alternate alternate history panel. I am Joe Compton. <coughs> I am moderating this panel, which has, an, as you can see, an awesome dais here. So I'll let them introduce themselves, and then we'll get started with some questions. So go ahead, Ron. My name is Ron Friedman. Uh, been a writer since 2005. My first short story was published 2011. I published 14 short stories. Uh, one anthology. I also edited three anthologies, and in March my alternate history uh, book came out, Typhoon Time. It's about a modern typhoon class submarine, nuclear submarine, uh, led by Holocaust survival and a few other experts from 21st century. Totally back in time to 1938 in an attempt to uh, prevent the Holocaust and World War II. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't. Fortunate, unfortunately, it didn't work for them that well, but fortunately for us it didn't work that well because now we have a story. Um, next. My name is Michael Skeet. Uh, I grew up maybe a 10 minute bike ride from this hotel, but I have lived in Toronto for the last 30 years, um, which is oddly enough how... <laughs> Not that there's a causal connection. Um, I sold the first short story I ever wrote to the uh, second ever Tesseracts anthology. And since then, my short fiction has appeared in um, half a dozen of the Tesseracts volumes, Asimov's, On Spec, a um, couple of years best anthologies, and um, uh, a fair number of themed <laughs> anthologies in various subjects across science fiction, fantasy, dark fantasy, and horror. Um, my first novel, which is a fantasy romance alternate history with some mystery thrown in, um, Poison <coughs> Prayer, was published last year by Five Rivers, and a follow-up, A Tangled Weave, will be coming <coughs> out next spring. Hi, I'm Teresa Greenwood, and I write historical crime fiction, and this is Kill As You Go is launching at 3 o'clock today in the Fireside Room, and thank you. I'm really excited about it, and, uh, and, also, and I'm really grateful to Coffin Hop Press, who are here, you know, just giving her at this conference, too, and, and they uh, brought this out as part of their year of women in publishing. Uh, I also have a memoir about the Fort McMurray wildfire that, uh, because I lived in, I live still in Fort McMurray, and that's coming out from the University of Alberta Press in April. And it's not alternate history, it's actually true, I guess, <laughs> or as true as I recall it being. And in terms of alternate history, uh, I sometimes write about real life crime uh, that happened in Canada, but with alternate endings. And at the moment, I'm working on a novel about a famous 1923 jailbreak where Red Ryan, who, if you're a bit of a connoisseur of crime writing, you probably heard of him. I want to question list, but I just love to break out of Kingston Pen. And uh, Ernest Hemingway happened to be the Toronto Star reporter that was sent down to, to cover it, which is, was only a recently discovered secret because he had a big fight with his editor, and his editor took the byline off of all of the stories. So hopefully we'll talk about that a little bit more. My name is Ron Hoare. I write as R.J. Hoare. Uh, I started off writing short stories. I won a short story contest. But my editors kept telling me this short story sounds more like a novel. So fortunately, I got, had a publisher pick up one of my novels. I've written two fantasy trilogies. I've written a um, couple of standalone fantasy near science fiction. I have a uh, series of uh, fantasy detective novellas, The Housetrap Chronicles. And um, I've read alternate history novels. And what happened to me was I uh, saw a headline in the newspaper, something about how we mistreated our indigenous folk. And that triggered a sort of a thought in my brain, well, I wonder what would have happened if the shoe had been on the other foot. And then I wondered, how would I write that? So I wrote a uh, lengthy novel about the, North, the Americans discovering Europe first and arriving with the heavy artillery, sent it to a publisher. They said, this is too long. Break it in half, enlarge those pieces, and write a third. So I did. The uh, Toltec Dawn is the first of the series. The second one, Toltec Khan, is out. And the third one, which I was hoping to have in my hands for today, isn't yet, 
uh, Toltec Noon. Um, they threatened to turn it into a series, but I'm happy with the trilogy. Thanks. Well, I want to know right off the bat from all of you, how much of the actual event that you're writing about that existed, how much of an expert do you need to be in order to alternate the hit? Maybe I'll start. You need to do quite an intensive research. You, uh, alternate history, for those who are not familiar, it's uh, that history going according to our own timeline, our own history. And then there is one event, and then history uh, going to a different direction. So that means we, that's a what if question. So a lot of, free, a lot of people thinking, what if something happened? And now, for example, in my novel, I, since it's also a military affair, submarine story, I had to, and my background is, I was in the Air Force, Israeli Air Force, so I don't have a lot of background in submarines, so I need to get the submarine parts right, because a lot of the readership are in the States, and they are ex-military, and if you make any mistake, they will hunt you down, and they will know about that. Uh, same thing with history, so I, I need to read a lot of, uh, I had to read a lot of about, about World War II. Uh, there is, uh, I don't know how many of you knows, but in Germany, uh, before the war, and also probably everybody, a lot, a lot of people who saw Valkyrie. Anyone saw Valkyrie, but the try attempt in 1944 to the there, there was a similar attempt, less known in 1938 by a few German generals, uh, some of them also were part of the 1944. It was called the Ustor Conspiracy. Uh, there were a lot of opportunity to prevent the war or make the world taking a different direction back then. Uh, so in addition to doing uh, research, a lot of research that I did through reading and watching movies, I also have some historical background. I came from a family of Holocaust survivors. Uh, also, my grandfather, he was a Polish officer in 1939. His battalion went to stop the German panzers. Didn't went very well. Uh, very few survived. Uh, so I tried to talk some of this personal story that my grandfather told me a few years ago and try to apply them here. And here it's, it's a different scenario. It's happened in Czechoslovakia. It's a different, different background. But uh, I used some of his experience into what could happen in a different scenario. So you need to know your history very, very well up to the point of departure, because people who like this genre will know it. But even if you go to a new direction, once you go to a new direction, you still not to know, need to know the characters who are the main influencer at that time and how they would react to the change in a way that is plausible. <coughs> and people will still believe you are telling a story that real people will indeed behave that way. Sure. I started out as a, as a journalist, a newspaper reporter, and a CBC broadcaster. And so I thought I had to always tell exactly the facts mm -hmm. all the time and know every little detail. And then I would, you know, go crazy when I couldn't find it. And then I realized, wait, the, the gap that you don't know, that's your opportunity, right, to write your own history. And so, if, for example, in the... It's a known fact that this guy broke out of jail. It's a known fact that Ernest Hemingway covered it. It's a known fact that the Prince of Wales was riding on a train through town around the same time. But what they were all doing, nobody knows. It's not recorded. So it's a great opportunity to fill that gap in with your own creativity. But I also learned you have to be, as it's exactly what Ron was saying, the train schedule must be exactly right because there are all kinds of train hobbyists out there who know every schedule for every train that ever left Montreal for Edmonton in 1923. So you better get that right or you, the rest of your, it, it just ruins it for the reader because they've stubbed their toe on that piece. And also telegraphs, apparently. People are very... There's a lot of telegraph hobbyists who know all about Morse code and things like that. So you, sometimes I just don't rate what the Morse code was. I just said, and then they sent a telegram, and that you know kind of can save you having to do all that research on how you actually type things out on a on a telegraph. It, if you're slowing down the story with the research, don't don't put it in. And they will send you email and oh, tell you what they. Lots of them. <laughs> I think it all depends on the story itself. Um, the alternate history background in Poison Prayer is just that, background. Um, and it was mostly done for my own amusement. It doesn't actually have a huge impact 
on the nature of the, the story um, or even the characters, really. I was just having some fun. Uh, on the other hand, I've got an alternate history U.S. Civil War novel uh, in which the uh, winter capital of the Kingdom of Canada is New Orleans. So you can imagine that there's a fair amount of work going into that particular alternate. PD. Uh, and again, whenever any aspect of the story has a direct impact on a character, then yeah, you have to know what you're talking about. Um, if the character is firing uh, a carbine based on the Colt action, then you have to know what the Colt revolving carbine looked like, how it was made, how it worked, what its weaknesses were, stuff like that. Um, you also have to know a little bit about the slave-based economy in the southern U.S. Um, but again, as you were saying, if the detail, if the background slows down the story, then it has to go, because the story is ultimately what matters. And as for changing, I mean, alternate history, it's your game. You can justify pretty much anything as long as it coheres to the internal logic of your story. It doesn't have to match what actually happened, as long as your story is set after what I call the break point. And it had better be set fairly well after the break point, or why are you bothering? One of the reasons um, I write fantasy is I'm trying to avoid a lot of research. <laughs> so, of course, uh, when I started this project, I was trying to figure out, well, how will I do, how will I justify this? And I think I have to admit that my book, I've changed so many small elements that this is more of a fantasy than a serious attempt at alternate history. But my triggering point actually takes place off stage a couple of hundred years in the past when a Chinese trading fleet which did exist, but not when I write about it, happened to drop in on Mexico and interact with the Toltec Empire. And that's another story because doing my research, trying to figure out, well, who was around at the time I wanted to invade England, um, I came up with the Toltecs, except people aren't really sure. There was three different theories about the Toltecs at the time I was doing my research. One was, they didn't exist. Two was they were a bunch of magicians with crystal skulls. And the third theory was they were a military state that conquered all of Mexico. And uh, so, okay, I'll use them and I'll take version three. But I had to change a lot of things in order to get the Toltec to invade Europe. Well, um, Again, once you do that, you're now interacting with people who did exist, and hopefully I didn't bend them too badly. Mm -hmm. But uh, for instance, one of my characters they're interacting with is Robin of Loxley, but also Richard the Lionheart is out there in the background. But it gives you a great big unlimited world because you're changing the direction of a lot of things. And uh, I ne had no idea of the nightmares I was gonna create when I got into this. Yeah. On that point, has anything that you thought you, when you first started your story on the alternate side of things, anything in your research changed and altered your alternate history when you, when you got into it and started writing it? Or did the characters speak to you and change anything within your alternate history? I, actually, I can answer that one a little bit, and it could, from a p feminist perspective, which I think might, might be why I'm on the panel. But uh, when you're reading a lot of history, it's a, you know, history is written by the victors, and they tend to be white males, right? So the female characters completely disappear, or they're seen as loving support, or you know, horrors who disrupt the, uh, the hero from or the person from doing what they were supposed to be doing. But when you start digging into the characters, you find out they're, they're much more complex. So I was doing some writing about Sir John A. Macdonald. There's a lot of stuff we could talk about him. But <coughs> his sister was a major fig main female figure in his wife, although he was married. They were incredibly close. And she ran his business operations. And in all the historical records, she's known as just a righteous bitch. Like, like really nasty, spinster and bitter and twisted. 
And then when you read their letters to each other, they're incredibly close, incredi they were almost the same person. She was just the female version of him. He got to be the father of the country, and she got to be a righteous bench spinster seen as living off of his avails, even though she did all his land deals. Uh, he trusted her with every little business thing, including the crooked kind of stuff. Although uh, the one difference was apparently she was a teetotaler. Oh, anyway, I, I tossed that out there. <laughs> a, a similar thing I'll, I'll tack on the end about the, this prison escape that I was talking about earlier. If you scratch the surface of that as well, uh, it was the first escape from Kingston Pan. They were able to escape because, you know, you hear Boston veterans trained in uh, diversionary tactics. So they just created a diversion, completely outwitted the guards, slapped the ladder up on the wall, had a car waiting, and, uh, and away they went. But in nothing in the history of that is it recorded that they learned they were they learned to do that uh, killing people you know as soldiers for the government they were just seen as in the time in the newspapers as you know the criminal mind running running amok so it, those kinds of things I think create it, uh, I don't know if it's an alternate version of history or a truer or a more complete version of history but anyway I just I tossed that Maybe out a for the, a different perspective yeah. One of the things I ran into, like, uh, you don't know what you're going to f run afoul of when you get started on this, was that uh, I decided I'd tell the point of view of three different characters. One was a Toltec army officer in charge of a fort in England. One was a Saxon girl trying to escape England. And another was an Irish lad um, indentured to a Toltec god a temple. Well now, when you start work mucking about with religions and religions of Mexico and who knows what, well we know what some of the, if they exist. So I wound up boiling the Toltec gods down to two and throwing in plus the hundred gods. Mm -hmm. But then, okay, now I'm going to have them interacting with the Christians and Lord knows where this tale is going to take me before I'm through. But uh, when you start a project, you don't necessarily know where it's going to lead you. I knew. <laughs> I mean, um, the, the, the alternate history projects that I've worked on uh, have all had uh, a specific endpoint in mind, and I usually don't start writing until I know how the story is going to end. Uh, and more, more to the point, I guess, what the uh, terminal point of a, the main character's arc is because most of the stories, um, at least that I've worked on in the last decade or so, uh, the action has hinged on the uh, development and the design of the characters. So because of that, uh, and because of my own self-imposed rules for research, uh, I generally don't find myself being taken by surprise by anything that's going on. I've already created um, an internal world uh, that adheres to the logic of the uh, original setup, and uh, at that point, I'm in a position where I can handle anything that the characters throw at me, um, and so I do. And so I, it's just not something that uh, I ever worked. The, uh, the the problem with the uh, inherent misogyny in uh, our timeline history, I dealt with in this book by making it a fantasy, uh, and um, essentially having prayer uh, a, a real magical force, which means that women had every bit as much agency as men did. And although there is still inherent misogyny in the culture, the women are much better equipped to fight back. For me, uh, <coughs> the research did influence the way the book was uh, going to. Because the way I envisioned the book, I started the book, I didn't have an, any idea where it's going. It started with a what if question. What if you take these people and these most advanced weapons and send them back with a mission? So I, I decided one of the characters will be a pacifist, which is what a pacifist who hate nuclear weapon will be a, do in a nuclear submarine. So I need to find a reason for him. So two ways where research for the book influenced the way it was going. One is what I spoke earlier about the German conspiracy against the Nazi party before the Munich Agreement. Uh, I read some document that, a book that based on a document that uh, Whitehall, the British Foreign Office, they actually were engaged by some of the leaders of this resistance. And uh, those leaders told them, 
please don't uh, appease Hitler because if you do that, if you do that, uh, if you appease him, he will become very popular and will not be able to do anything. But if you oppose him and threaten a war, then we can organize a cop, a military cop, and take them, uh, take the, uh, them out, and then you have something like. Well, I think their original plan was to bring Wilhelm, the, the, bring what what they had before World War One. So it's still militaristic Germany, but without the racism. And there probably won't be war, or if there was a war, it would be at a different scale, a lot smaller scale. And other things that I found out during my research, like everybody knows that the Nazis persecuted the Jews. One of the characters was a black uh, Navy SEAL, and he and a few others, they they, they needed to go to Nazi Germany uh, to fly there and do some stuff. Uh, of course, for the Jews, there was a real risk, but I, I was looking, I knew that the Nazis were racist, and look, was looking what did they do for black, uh, what did they have against black people? And I found out in my research that in 1940, um, when they took over France and the French army surrendered, they simply executed 17,000 black Senegalese that served in the French army. So the, the white French, they went to prison camp, the black f soldiers in the French army shot. In, and not all of them, but 17,000. So there, is, there was a real stake, there was a real risk for a black person to travel to Nazi Germany back then. So I incorporate that as well in the, in the novel. That's awesome, nice. So what's, what's one pitfall that you see too often in this genre that you were very careful to avoid when you started your process? I think the biggest pitfall that I've encountered is making one change and then assuming it stops there. Uh, change doesn't work that way. Um, I remember reading a book, and I'm not going to name names. This was a long time ago anyway. Um, but the, uh, somehow they got it that um, the Habsburg dynasty in Spain had come to a premature end or something like that. Uh, and so there was a different ruling dynasty in Spain, but the only other change in the world was that the Philippines had a different name. Uh, it, it doesn't work that way. Um, stuff, it, in a way, you know, alternate history is a game and, and it's a bit of a mugs game because it really is impossible to predict with any degree of accuracy how one single change will cascade through time. And I agree with whoever it was who said that um, you set your, your pivot point, your change point, um, several hundred years before the events of your story to give change time to trickle through. Uh, but that means that you have simultaneously the freedom and the responsibility to make a lot of small changes. And that's actually one of the appeals of alternate history, I think. Mm -hmm. you, you scatter lots of tiny changes through and you stroke the ego of your readers when they figure out what you've done and you make what you've done you know, clear enough that uh, they can tell that you've done something. Um, you know, you, something as broad as making the governor of Canada in 1850 Lord Byron. Um, <laughs> something as minor as having an ex-US Army officer named Tecumseh Sherman and not William Tecumseh Sherman and there's a reason for that. So, you know, your reader is going to figure out there's a change here, go back and find out why, and then feel very smug <laughs> for having done it. A nice drink. <laughs> Sometimes when I start a story, I know the beginning and the end and nothing else. In this case, I knew the beginning and had clue where it was going to end. Um, that came as a surprise. Well, not as a surprise, but it was a problem. Um, I guess one advantage or disadvantage I had was that uh, several years ago, and for a period of several years, I was the, in charge of running a national Canadian history book contest. So every year I read about 30 or 40 Canadian history about that year. So I had a vague idea of how the um, conquest of the Americas happened. So um, I tried to sort of create as many of those in reverse, in other words, a plague, uh, religious conflicts, uh, settlers, all those good things. Uh, um. How biggest surprises, I guess, I had with this project was when I was pitching it to an agent. And he said, well, nobody reads that stuff anymore. Why should I promote it? 
And then I had to think of who had I read lately that wrote this stuff. <clears throat> Fortunately, I could think of somebody, but uh, <laughs> be prepared. I, I, and I guess for me, it's just what I mentioned earlier. Don't stop the flow of your story because you're so in love. Kill, you know, kill your darlings, right? That's the expression. And you think of something that's just, oh, it's over, and people are going to think I'm just so smart. But it just stops the story dead cold. So always keep an eye out for that because, yeah, we, could, we all do that. It's really hard to avoid... Uh, falling a little bit in love with your own cleverness and thinking this stuff up sometimes. <laughs> That's why I like using grace notes, because they don't actually affect the story, yeah. but they're there for people to pick up on. Uh, one of the pitfalls that is a concern for some alternate history is if the point of departure or the breakpoint when they start taking a new road, in many stories, it's people on the future. It's uh, Eric Flint in his 16th, uh, 1632 series, and S.M. Sterling is another Canadian author, but very known in alternate history. He wrote The Island in the Sea of Antarctica and uh, the Coast Guard, went to the Bronze Age. <laughs> so the problem I want to point out is the Bambi versus Godzilla uh, syndrome. <laughs> uh, also in my story, so you have a um, Cold War weapon, a uh, modernized Cold War weapon with two nuclear warheads going back to World War II. This could win the war in a day, in, in a few hours. So you want to make sure that in your story, when you have the Bambi versus Godzilla, uh, Godzilla, you want to make the evil Bambi a little bit stronger and make a lot of problem to the good Godzilla. So there will be challenge and there will be real stake and real risk for them that uh, they may fail in their mission or they may even die uh, just because they something. This is a pitfall you may want to be cautious of. Uh, again, if you have more than, I think also there was a weapon of choice. There was a... Birmingham, an Australian author. He also from the fleet from the 2020s went to World War II. Uh, the final countdown, final countdown is not alternate history because they didn't change history. Uh, but that's a point. You have very modern, advanced, knowledgeable scientists, weapons against the agents. You want to make it a little bit more balanced. Nice. So Michael touched on this a little bit. Uh, but how much is the process begins, does it begin with research and then you write your story or do you need to have your story in place before you start to really delve into the events that you're, that you're dealing with? Well, I had to know first the period in which the uh, story was going to be set, uh, what the story was primarily going to be about uh, and what sorts of people were going to be involved in it. Um, that third part could proceed independently of the mm -hmm. first two. Um, the, uh, alternate Civil War, which is called Dixie's Land, by the way, um, I knew that I wanted a setup where a better than even chance <coughs> to win the war, and also, purely for selfish reasons, I wanted a world where the primary power in North. So those were the starting points that I took on myself, and then I looked for a, a historical breakpoint that would justify um, those particular attitudes, and I came up with um, Horatio Nelson killing Napoleon Bonaparte at the end of the 18th century. So before the Louisiana Purchase, before Napoleon crowned himself emperor, this allowed the United Kingdom to claim Louisiana as spoils of war, uh, and also the United Kingdom to have a full army with which to fight the United States for ultimate possession of Louisiana. That sets up the world in which the story takes place. And the, uh, the fulcrum of the plot at that point is a filibuster, um, which was uh, 19th century terminology for essentially a private invasion of a sovereign country. A uh, very famous filibuster uh, in the 19th century in the United States named William Walker, who invaded uh, Nicaragua a couple of times and got himself uh, killed for it the last time. Uh, he actually is a character in this story, uh, but the country that's being filibustered is the Republic of Texas. Um, from that point, um, I've got the areas that, that I have to know fairly well already sketched out, and um, I've also got the, the fields within the time period 
sketched out so I know where my research has to focus. And at that point, it's more a matter of, as you said, whittling away the information rather than accumulating it. Um, just getting the information that's necessary to inform the character and set that character in his or her milieu and, and then um, knowing the rest of it, not putting it down on paper. Well, I guess with me looking at, first of all, when was I going to invade? Like, when would it make sense if I wanted to use gunpowder weapons? I couldn't be in BC. That would make it very difficult. So I had to have a pick a, a time period uh, when it was possible that uh, by advancing the Chinese earlier and bringing gunpowder to Mexico early, they would have had some type of gunpowder weapon by the time they reached Europe. Um, and then I knew from the historical readings that I'd done that uh, the European contest of conquest of North and South America basically wouldn't have happened except for the native allies of those Europeans. If the, the natives had been uh, organized as one block, like for instance, if the Aztecs hadn't had a civil war, if the Incas hadn't had a civil war, and if their local neighbors hadn't been upset with them, that would have been a completely different contest, content, continent, and that's you know another what if tale. So I was going to use the locals to aid the Toltec invasion. So I picked a time in England when the, the Civil War, Martha and Stephen and so on, if you know any of your English history, uh, the time when Cadfiel stories were set, uh, had the Toltec uh, land in Ireland, helped the Irish who then went to Wales to help the Welsh, and then they liberated the Saxons from the Normans. Um, so that was, I guess, what I used as a trigger. And, and thinking of something that Ron said, one of the, talking about weaponry, one of the things I didn't want to get into was a description of what were the firepower, what were those weapons. Uh, there's no sense having the people in the story talk about them because they are carrying them. They know what they are. So I described them as how they use them and what they look like, but not whether they're rifles or muskets or what they are. I, suitably kept that vague to keep me out of trouble. I, I'm actually uh, a total pantser, and it, when I do research, it, it can weigh me down. And I mentioned in a panel yesterday that um, I had gone, and when I want to recommend to everybody, if you're ever in Kingston, Ontario, and you get a chance to go to the Corrections Canada Museum, go. It's free. They have the history of... Uh, corrections in Canada and including the establishment of all the prisons and they have these crazy things like things that inmates invented uh, carved guns carved out of soap and and mailbags they sewed so they could hide in the mailbags and try to escape prison it's really worth it if you get a chance to go and I had file cabinets just full of research about the prison and the history and blah, blah, blah. and then uh, our house burned down in the Fort McMurray fire and it took all the research with it and I realized this is actually a good thing because it's what I've been waiting for because what I really, the way I really write a story is I, I, I write about the character and I decide what character is going to carry the story through and then I use the right research around it. So now I've been able to back into the story. I'll go back again and go see David, the very nice archivist there, and I'll have my list of things I need to fill in. But that's, that's the way I'll do it. Yeah, when I wrote my book, uh, look, and Otto, during his career, he can change his perspective, and as human, we change. When I wrote the book, I started quite some text. Also, it's been too many reiterations, so when I started, it started with a what-if question, and I was more pencer back then, so I was evolving as I found more information. I started writing about the scenario, and then I started reading what were the characters, what were the historical forces in the period and how they would react or may react to such a thing and who could be the allies of the people who came back in time etc etc and now in my latest short story I'm actually become a little bit more outliner so I found it a little bit more efficient for me if I know what what is the main point and how it's going to end I have a better direction so for that you need to do at, at least some of the research at the beginning before you even start writing, while, while you outline, and then you add the resources. But after you're done, you still need to 
fine tune it to avoid those people who knows better than you about weapons <laughs> the or weapon better than you about um, what was the schedule of the train in, uh, or zeppelins point. or whatever right? oh god so zeppelins. you need to you need to fix those uh, <laughs> specific issues as mm -hmm. well so this book it was more pencer <laughs> So at this time, I want to open it up to questions from the audience. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. So after your break point, and you've gone through this alternate history, uh, <clears throat> I think you've touched a little bit about how you figure out those dominoes and the ripple effects and whatnot. Do you have a process you've come up with about kind of... <laughs> well, to, to some extent, the process starts with self-indulgence. What do I want to see? <laughs> and then can I justify it? So in um, both of the alternate worlds that I've created for this novel and the uh, um, American Civil War novel, uh, the uh, Habsburg Empire is considerably stronger than it was in uh, our timeline, just because I've got a soft spot for the Habsburgs. Um, but even down to individual characters. So um, Ulysses Grant in Dixie's Land is uh, a complete failure and a drunk at the start of the book because his wife is dead. Um, in real life, uh, Julia Grant kept him stable um, and managed to help him keep his alcoholism under control. Uh, so I've taken that away from him in, in the book. Okay. Uh, in this book, um, as I said before, all of the, uh, the post-breakpoint stuff is so deep background that it doesn't really affect the characters at all and they don't think about it. Uh, there is no French king. There is, however, um, a Burgundian emperor who rules an empire from Paris. Uh, that has no effect on the day-to-day -day life of the characters of the book, so it's just a grace note. Um, it gets mentioned a lot, but I don't draw any attention to it and I don't explain it. I think there's a paragraph in here that talks about the ultimate failures of the Valois, um, which did happen. It's just that because religion and magic in this world are so carefully intertwined, um, the 16th, 15th and 16th century wars of religion in France did not happen. Um, just all of it, I've got the Plantagenets still ruling in England, so there was no English Civil War uh, at the beginning of the century in which this story is set. And uh, although he doesn't feature in this book, uh, he will feature in uh, another book when it eventually gets written. Uh, the, the King of England at, the, at this time is Richard VI. Uh, a lot of this stuff you can do just to satisfy yourself. It's not a requirement. Um, again, because, and this is a lesson that took me a long time to learn, the world of, uh, of any novel, alternate history or otherwise, is actually really tightly focused and um, the hardest part of writing it is to pare away the stuff that doesn't have to be there. And, and that means that, on the one hand, a lot of the research that you do and a lot of the sort of world building that you do never makes it onto the page. Uh, at the same time, it's nice to have done it because it's in the back of your head while you're writing, and so it can influence the way the characters are without you ever having to explain it. It's one of the things I like about alternate history. Nobody else is going to talk. I'll, I guess I'm going to talk. Mm -hmm. the, you, you wanted the reaction. You need to know the, diff the major players, the major characters in the, our own history that will still exist in the alternate timeline. And you need to know what kind of ideology they're going to have, uh, which will influence the way they behave. So I can give one example in my submarine story. Uh, before the, before the war in 1938, the U.S. tried to stay out of it. They didn't they want to. Most of the American didn't want to get involved at all. So the, some people went to the White House and spoke with uh, uh, Roosevelt and uh, Eisenhower was there taking notes. And uh, they mentioned, hey, by the way, in December 1941, the Japanese are going to attack Pearl Harbor. What? 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 And they, can you say that again? Can you repeat that? So, uh, yeah. So you need to know that they're going to be surprised when they learn some new pieces of information. You need to know the, the ideology, the course of action they, it's likely to drive them into. So you do need to do some research and you need to learn a bit about characters and found, found interesting stuff. Uh, I can, uh, anybody here read uh, Harry Turtledove? 
Yeah, the whole series, uh, every, whole series about uh, World War. I'm uh, sorry, about an alternate history uh, that the South won the Guns Civil the War. South. Guns of the South is one book, but then he had a whole series of books. Uh, so he basically tried to create the history from you of Europe in the Americas. Examples are like how the South was, uh, I think, in World War One, the, the, the trench warfare between the North and the South again. The North so took over Canada. Uh, then they they have something the the south eventually lost the war but they, they still exist like Germany lost the war World War one but still exist and then they have some extreme that was persecuting blacks like uh, the Nazi were persecuting Jews so we, it drew parallel from our modern history and put it in a completely different frame and did the whole series about it the history of America like the history of Europe but assuming the world war uh, the the south won world, uh, the civil war so you, you do need to know your history and the ideology and how things can progress and drew on this in order to generate proper reaction of the different powers. So yeah, I, well, I'm working on a novel too, like, but one thing I realized is that if you make a major change in history at one point, people will start marrying different people with families, you get mixed up, people move elsewhere, and suddenly all the historical features a hundred years later have never been born in different people altogether. And I've seen people kind of forget about that fact. If you change something in the 1800s, you can't then describe what happens to the Beatles because they don't exist anymore. Sure they do. Uh, you're, you're the writer. You can do pretty much whatever you want. Uh, they may not, the Beatles may have Pete Best or maybe Stu Sutcliffe is still around. But if you're writing a, a period that's 200 years after a, a change point, let's say, there's no reason why the Beatles couldn't exist. They might not call themselves that. They you know, you could have John Lennon and Paul McCartney um, backing up Jerry and the Pacemakers, just to be silly about it. But um, I, I said earlier that it's an artificial construct. Uh, and you do enter into a sort of a contract with the reader that says we are playing a game here and we're not going to pretend that this is rigorous history or that it is rigorous causality because <coughs> that's an impossibility. Um, to me it's the same way as when you're um, reading a novel that's written from a first person perspective. If you think about it, technically the person who's telling you this story is the person who lived it. So she already knows when she starts telling the story how it ends. You're making an agreement as the writer with your reader that you are going to all pretend we don't know this. And we're going to go through the story as if it was happening, even though technically speaking the narrator already knows everything. It's a game that we play and uh, you have to accept that you are playing games, otherwise you will tie yourself up in knots and you'll end up like the caterpillar who suddenly tries to figure out, or the centipede who tries to figure out how it is he walks. Do, do you find that the books that you enjoy writing more are the books that the readers enjoy more? Uh, it's hard to use the word enjoy um, <laughs> when describing the writing process for me, but um, I will say this, um, I enjoy the process a lot more with each successive year and each successive book. Um, and it, so it may well be that there's a link that way. The um, people seem to enjoy this book um, more than most of my other writing. Um, maybe that's just because this one is more lighthearted. I decided I'm a storyteller and I'm not trying to change the world here. <laughs> I found that as a pantser, uh, often when I knew the beginning, and didn't know the ending. One of the reasons I was writing the book was to find out what happened <laughs> because I enjoyed Great. the story. So what are you all, talk about your books a little bit and what you've got going on and, and what, you, what you're working on now for us. Well, the, um, the follow-up, I won't call it a sequel, although several of the characters from this uh, Tangled Weave is in <clears throat> production process now. Um, it was originally supposed to be out for this con conference, but uh, things got delayed and that was mostly my fault, so I take that on me. Um, Dixie's Land, the book that I was talking about as well, is at DAW at the moment. 
um, being analyzed, I guess. Um, and uh, I've got a 16th century Japanese murder mystery that is ready to go out to agents. Um, nothing alternate about that. It's just straight up history. Oh, and I'm hoping to have a story in the next Tesseract anthology. Although I still haven't heard back. I, I just I do want to I don't want I've talked a lot about what I'm working on, but I want to encourage everybody at three o'clock to go to the fireside room and pop in on the coffin hop guys. And if if these aren't your thing, they've got all kinds of fantasy and all and uh, anthology collections and weird tales of the West, which is a fantasy western kind of thing. so they really have something for everybody so I just really if you can support them I think that would be great they're really working hard to do what they can for Calgary writers and writers in general yeah I've got uh, right now I've got a my first attempt at a space opera uh, <laughs> has been accepted by the publisher it's going through the grinding of the editing process right now so while I'm waiting for that to, to breathe air I just started a sort of an urban fantasy novel that may turn out to be science fiction, although I didn't originally intend it that way. And this afternoon I'm meeting with my publisher to talk about, among other things, um, the, these fantasy detective novellas that I write. When we get three published, they, they come out as ebooks, but then when there's three published, uh, she puts them in a, in a collection. I've got two collections of those and I've got two surplus ones lying around right now that are out but not in anything in print so I've sent her a couple of more of these little things I do to give me a complete change of pace and I want to talk to her about that plus the fact that this science fiction the space opera that I wrote I've already written what I thought was the sequel but it isn't really because I've thought of another idea to <laughs> finish it so <laughs> I want to find out how long does she want to run with this madness? <laughs> uh, Typhoon Time is currently available in Oil's Nest and the Century Box here in the Vendor uh, corner. It's an Amazon.ca number one bestseller in time travel. I'm very proud about that. It was released by Wildfire Press. That's an American publisher. Uh, it's an indie, but a big indie. They have uh, very big names over there. Uh, Kevin J. Anderson is the publisher, but they have, they're writing Dune, Star Wars, a lot of military SF, alternate history, things like that. So the book is a standalone with an open ending. I'm waiting for the sale result from January and then they decide if they want to make it into a series. But for now, I'm uh, not wasting time. I'm worti working on uh, something, that, uh, another book that based on a short story collection series that is more similar to The Expanse, things that happen in the solar system and in space. Yeah, but this one is available. Um, you can uh, check it out here in the vendor area. Right. And it's selling well and got the good feedback. Right. Well, thank you, panel, for uh, indulging us. And uh, thank you, audience, for your great questions. And uh, we're all done. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.